As we uh, continue in our storyboard series, we'll look at another story from the Old Testament that I believe God is able to use to foreshadow much of what we are experiencing today in our culture, certainly in this country. And uh, it's found in Judges, um, the 13th chapter, although we'll be looking at a couple of chapters in, in Judges. It's the story of Samson. And I'm sure that you have heard, when I mentioned Samson, you've undoubtedly heard something uh, of the story of Samson. You probably uh, immediately think of the name Delilah. Hey there, Delilah. <laughs> uh, and, and just the reality that here's a story that I'm not sure, at least when I was growing up in Sunday school, um, I'm not sure it was presented all that well. And I say that because I remember as a young man, uh, you know, the color, they had you know, those color pictures <laughs> in, in church as a kid, the color, and Samson was always this big buff guy. And as a kid, you're like, man, I want to be Samson, right? <laughs> I mean, and I think the reason um, that it's hard to tell the Samson story is because really it's one of those rated R stories of the Bible. <laughs> There's aspects of it that you're like, ooh, uh, can we say that? Can we really talk about that? I mean, Samson had some real serious problems. But the reason I say I think it's a story that foreshadows so well where we are in our culture is how many of you agree with that we live in a rated R society? <laughs> it's just very much so. I mean, it's, it's so as many of the things that, that Samson struggled with, and I think things that we can learn from his story, not necessarily because of what he did, but what he didn't do and what he struggled with. The story of a man who was given incredible power, and yet again and again struggled with his own flesh and began to uh, experience far less than I think God intended for him. So I begin this way. Let's think about the parents, his father Manoah, his mother, childless. That was not her name. That was her experience. She may have felt like it was a name. Often when you're not able to have children, you can feel like it becomes a label, identifies who you are, how people look at you and perceive you. And on this particular day that I want to take you back to, I can just imagine Samson's parents making their way to a Philistine city. Possibly unable to really even talk to one another. Just consumed by their grief and the thoughts running through their mind. It was not supposed to be this way. It was not supposed to end like this. I mean, if you look at it from their perspective, here's this woman who undoubtedly had prayed and prayed, her husband Manoah praying with her that they would be able to have children. And eventually, one day, an angel appears to them and tells them that they indeed will be blessed with a child. But not just any child. He will be a child who will have the Spirit of God upon him from the day he's born. And in the sense, he will have power that will be given to him. And he'll have a calling on his life. His calling will be to deliver the Israelites from the bondage and captivity of the Philistines. And by the time we arrive in Judges to the story of Samson... We need to be reminded, how did they get in this bondage? Well, Joseph, you'll recall, had been blessed of God. Joseph had led them into Egypt, had attained um, great power in Egypt. But as Scripture tells us, then another king came along in Egypt who did not know Joseph, didn't know anything about Joseph, had no connection to Joseph. And the Israelites began to struggle. And this cycle begins of they wander from God, turn their back on God, and find themselves enslaved as a people, and then they'll turn to God, ask God for forgiveness, seek God, and God will forgive them, and then the cycle will repeat itself. And God had raised up these leaders. This was before the first king. King David will eventually come along after King Saul, King Saul being the first king. But these judges are the leaders that God's calling up prior to the kings. Samson being one of those who had a unique calling upon his life. He was to be one who was to lead his people and deliver them. 
from the captivity and bondage to the Philistines. His life, I think it's safe to say, did not turn out the way his parents must have thought after the angel appeared to them and they awaited the birth of the child. And indeed, Scripture tells us in Judges 13, 24, and 25, the woman gave birth to a boy, named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahana, Dan, between Zorah and Eshterol. Now, one of the things that's neat about, for me, and this brings this story to kind of life, is as I was recently had the opportunity because of the church and your support to be able to travel in Israel, we actually were able to visit this place. Now, you never know if you're exactly in the exact spot, right? It's a big area. But these two towns are still able to be identified. And so you know that somewhere in that region, Samson roamed the land. His story unfolded. I think there's much that we can learn from Samson's story. So let's, let's just kind of jump into some of the points and then I want to unpack it. If you're familiar with the story, I've entitled it, Samson, Wake Up. Because you know at the end when he's having this relationship with Delilah and basically at that point just begins to play games with his whole strength and power. Delilah will, he'll, she's asking him, how do you have such strength? How can we weaken you? And he somehow either doesn't understand that she's trying to deceive him because she's a Philistine or he has reached a point where he just doesn't care. And so he begins to say to her, well, if you tie me with fresh rope. And so he gets tied up and then she says, wake up, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he just breaks the ropes immediately. And then there's a couple of other occasions where he says, well, if you do this or if you do this. All the while, as this game unfolds, Samson's getting closer and closer to the reality. You see, something that's key to the story of Samson that we must understand is that he was de dedicated at birth as a Nazarite. Now, this was a, an oath that, that many would take, uh, and it showed you were dedicated to God. You were God's person. And there were three primary aspects to that dedication. You would drink no, no drink, uh, nothing from the fruit of the vine, no wine, no alcohol, and it was, a, it was to be a visible sign that others could see that commitment that you had made. The second part was you're not to touch any dead bodies, to remain pure. It was understood that, that death, if you drew near to death, that um, that would make you unclean. And so part of that Nazarite vow was I would ne you're never going to touch a dead body or dead carcass, both human or animal. And the third part, so that everyone would know they were to never cut their hair. Meaning that as their hair grew, it would be a constant reminder that of the vow they had taken. It was not anything about the hair. It was about the reminder, a visible reminder. And every time he tried to do something with his long hair, he was reminded of the vow that had been taken on his part as a child and then that he had taken upon himself as he grew older. But if you know anything about the story, you discover that Samson did not take that vow seriously. And as a result, his life would be far less than what it could have been. As we look at some points about waking up to the blessing of God, if, if we're reminded of anything in the story of Samson, it's that God was the one who gave him his strength. Samson could do nothing on his own. We talk about recently in our Power Up series, in our Vacation Bible School, the reality is that God is the one who powers us up. And that's certainly the case for Samson. It was God who gave him his power. But he would fail to understand that and put it into practice in, in ways he needed to. And so some of the things that I think we can learn from him, if we think about the blessing of God on our life. And by the way, uh, I'm going to do this series of uh, a little midweek devotion I've been working on about blessing. How many of you have seen hashtag blessed, right? You ever seen anybody do that hashtag blessed? 
What does it even mean, right? I don't want to get a sidetrack, but when we think about the blessing of God, if we're not careful in this culture, it can mean everything's going good and, uh, and prosperity is upon me, right? I'm, I'm being blessed financially. I'm being hashtag blessed. And I'm not saying that's not anything to do with it, but you need to know out of a, over 100 verses in the New Testament that make reference to bless, blessing, or blessed, none of them have anything to do with financial prosperity or things. To be blessed of God means really to be close to God, to be near to God, to be experiencing the fullness of God in your life. And so that can be reflected in a lot of ways, but that's what Scripture understands the blessing of God to be. And so when we think about waking up to the blessing of God's strength, that as it relates to strength, the blessing of God is that as long as I stay close to God, I'm going to be empowered by God, empowered by His Spirit. I'm going to have the strength I need for no matter what I face. And what we learn in Samson's story is he struggled to do that. And I think the reason it reflects so well where we are is I know in my own life, I too can relate to the struggles of continually relying upon God, leaning on God, allowing God to empower me. We all know something of what it is as Americans to, to think I can do it in my own strength. And Samson would discover that painfully as well. Waking up to the blessing of God's strength involves, first of all, praising God for what he's done. You, you've done that this morning. I so appreciated meeting with those who were baptized as they shared with me some of their story. And what I heard again and again was just praising God for what he's done. You heard some of that in Jennifer's testimony this morning. And just the reality that God is working. He's drawing me near. And I feel blessed because I feel close to God. And I feel like God is answering prayer in his timing. Praising God for what he's done. That's why we begin every week. John, I appreciate the work you do and the worship team put in and bringing us to on the first day of the week that we come together and we just worship and praise God. Because the first step in waking up, and I love how our worship team, sometimes we even use that language, are you woke up, right? <laughs> that, should have, uh, that should wake you up, right? After Tyler finished on the drum, that should wake you up. And I hope you saw when Tyler was playing the drum, just praising God. For all that he's done. Now the reason that's part of Samson's story is even before Samson's born, Judges tells us that that's what was happening. His parents were praising God. They had been praying for a child. Now they're going to have a child. We're told in Judges 13, Manoah inquired of the angel, Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? He replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. It is wonderful. Some theologians think this was even Jesus was the angel who appeared to them. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. They worshiped and praised God before Samson's even born. They're waking up to the blessing of God and God's strength and what God's going to do. And in that moment, as they are praising God, they are so hopeful that their son, Samson, will be the one to deliver the people. Well, if you know the, the story of Samson, you know that when he had the strength, he, um, he just seemed to... Make a game out of it. Like, he told his mom and dad he'd seen a girl in, Philis, uh, in the Philistine territory and he wanted to marry her. He just came back and said, uh, get her for my wife. <laughs> Remember, this is in a time and a culture where the parents would arrange marriages and he's saying, get this woman. Now, this was not somebody they had in mind. Probably up to that point, they had been looking at somebody within their own uh, family and faith, not family necessarily, not, don't think Kentucky, just... Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they, they were looking for somebody in their own, among their own people. And here, here he is looking outside to the enemy and the Philistines. And he finds this woman. He says, go get her. I want her for my wife. His parents said to him, are, are there not any women among our people? I mean, why? Why are you going to go find a wife 
among the enemy. Samson, don't you understand your calling? Don't you understand who you are, who you've been called to be? What are you doing? Scripture says one day as Samson was on his way to the Philistine territory, I think it's a sign, there was a lion that attacked him. Just out of the blue, this lion pounces on him, right? And we get a glimpse of his strength because Scripture says he, take, he takes the lion and just rips it in two. <laughs> like, man, I would have loved to color that page in, in Sunday school as a young man, huh? Wow, just... They didn't tell me about it. You just ripped the lion in two. And then it says, are you ready for this? He ripped it like you would rip a young goat. Is that a thing? <laughs> like, I don't know. Do people go around ripping young goats like the standard average guy? I'm not as strong as Samson. I can just rip a young goat. I don't know. I mean, that sounds pretty strong to me. I'm not going to try to rip any goats. It says he ripped the lion in two. Scripture tells us the enemy is like a roaring lion. Somehow it tells me that he was already being reminded that when you enter the enemy territory, the lion is present. And you may think you have the strength, and God has indeed given us the strength to be victorious over the lion. We can be victorious, but we don't need to make a game out of it. Later, we're told in Scripture that Samson was on his way yet again to the Philistine territory, undoubtedly going down to marry this woman. And like any guy who's done something, you know, macho and big, like ripping a lion, I mean, other guys can rip young goats. I ripped a lion. He remembered it. He gets to that part. He probably starts thinking, wait a second, around here somewhere, I ripped a lion in half. And he looks, and sure enough, there's the carcass. And in the carcass is some honey. Oh, don't miss the, the imagery here. As he looks at that dead carcass, he had to know at that point, you have taken the vow of a Nazarite. You are not to come in contact with any dead body. Not only are you making your way into the Philistine territory, into the camp of the enemy. Now you're going to go over and take honey from the carcass of this dead lion. Can everybody say, ooh, are you serious? He scoops up some of the honey and is on his way. We're told he even gave some to his mom and dad, but he did not tell them where it came from. Anybody want to take a guess why he didn't tell them where it came from? <laughs> it's kind of a subtle way to let us know he knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew he wasn't supposed to be doing that. And it's all of a sudden here that I find myself able to relate to Samson more than I would like to. I go from this kid who colored pictures of him, only understanding kind of the cool parts of his story, to becoming an adult and realizing like, ooh, I don't know if I want to be Samson. I mean, I, I don't think I want to be. And then you know what's frightening? I look in the mirror and I, outside of the physical part, I start looking a lot like Samson. Because I know what it is to be dedicated and committed to God and find myself moving into territory, places where I know, what are you doing? What are you doing? You see, the second part of waking up to the blessing of God is preparing yourself for the attacks of the enemy. Evidently, Samson had forgotten all about who he was and what he was called to do. And he's not preparing himself at all for the attack of the enemy. How many of you know the enemy is going to attack you? If I do nothing else, I want to encourage you. Jesus told us about an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You will see that enemy. And part of what it means to walk by faith and, and, to, and to draw near to God and come to understand the truth is you begin to, to see how the enemy is coming against you. And can I suggest to you 
at least from a man's perspective, and certainly from the story of Samson, there are three key ways that the enemy comes against Samson. Lust, entitlement, and pride. And when I look at those three things and I see that the enemy was able to use lust, entitlement, and pride to basically take Samson out, I all of a sudden discover that in all these many years, the tactics of the enemy haven't changed all that much. And we live in a culture, I could probably build a strong case that those three things, lust, entitlement, and pride, maybe have never been more strong Maybe as strong, but I don't know if it's ever been stronger than, than what we're experiencing right now. I know many of you might agree with me that as we hear stories and see experience that, that we feel like we live at a time where the most entitled generation that maybe has ever lived is walking the earth. Incredibly entitled. A time when lust, like you can't escape it. I mean, it, it was, it's always been bad, but I mean, the internet has just taken it to a whole other level and like lust is just constantly. I mean, you've got to be strategically planning how to avoid the lustful tax of the enemy. And pride? <laughs> wow. I mean, did I say more? I mean, pride, rampant. And when you look at the story of Samson, you say, how was these things working and playing themselves out? Lust is, I want it. He saw the, the, the Philistine girl and he said, I want her. Mom, dad, go get her. <laughs> I want it. And even though it was clearly, that's the enemy camp, Samson, what are you doing? And it wasn't just with this, his first wife. If you read the story, you find out, I mean, even with Delilah, same kind of thing, I want her. Just constantly, whatever he wanted, he thought should be his. And that's what led him into the entitlement. Not only do I want it, I deserve it. How many of you know that our culture is spending billions of dollars in advertising to appeal to this very need? How many of you heard commercials like, you deserve a break today, right? Now that may be true. God would say, yeah, you deserve a break. It's called the Sabbath. <laughs> Work that in there. But culture says, no, 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 don't worry about the Sabbath. Just come to McDonald's, right? And they try to tie in this concept of you deserve it to whatever their product is. I want it. I deserve it. And what does pride say? I can handle it. I got this. I can handle it, right? His mom and dad probably said to him on a number of occasions, Samson, do you really need to be going into the enemy territory so much? Do you realize Samson's story is told in four chapters? Let me encourage you to read those four chapters, and you will discover something. He spends far more time, according to those four chapters, in the Philistine territory than he does at home with his own people. And everybody said, Shame on you, Samson, because we would never do that, would we? We make it a priority to be with our people. Wouldn't miss my community group, right? Wouldn't miss church at all. It's important. I need to be there with my people. It's where I gain my strength. That's how we live, right? Right? Come on, let's be honest, right? We spend a lot of time out in the enemy territory and we constantly find ourselves watching shows, doing things, going places, and we say over and over again, I can handle it. I can handle it. I got this. Might be a problem for someone else, but I can handle it. And it's true. Up until the day you can't. And how many stories do we hear over and over again where somebody, yep, they were doing good. Doing, oh, well, would have never thought that would have happened to them. I want it. 
I deserve it. I can handle it. And those three things the enemy used to bring Samson down. Now, I want to be clear about something. I'm not necessarily talking about from a faith standpoint in terms of salvation. I believe someday I'll get the chance to talk to not only color a picture of Samson, I think I'll get a chance to talk to him. I think Samson will be in heaven. I'm not saying it's a salvation issue. What I'm saying is Samson was someone who was called of God to do great things for God with the power God had given him, and he squandered it and played games with it to the point when his parents come and remove the rubble of the collapsed building, they must have thought, how did it end like this? When the angel appeared to us, we never pictured this. And all I'm trying to say is it's a story that foreshadows some, a story that's played out in our culture so many times. I don't think sometimes when people fail, I don't think it's a salvation issue. God is gracious. God will forgive. If you're truly saved, you're saved. But how heart-wrenching is it to see the devil win these victories, destroying families, destroying people, reputations and testimonies and witnesses, just ripping them like some people rip a young goat. Preparing for the battle. Let me give you a couple quick points. How do you prepare for the battle? You got to break the trance. If the enemy has a way of kind of pulling into a trance and you know there's a place, there's a weakness, there's a temptation, something related to lust, you got to break the trance. Pray and get into the Word. Let the Word renew your mind. Don't just give in to it. Don't let him convince you it's not a big deal because it wasn't a big deal for Samson until it was. One of the things I learned when I came to Tulare, it kind of surprised me. I'm just going to be honest. One of the things I notice, you know, sometimes when a new person comes to town, they see things you, probably, you may not notice. One of the things I noticed was car washes. Now, it's not that they didn't have car washes in Modesto, just not as many, right? And not only did they have not as many, I, didn't ha- I had never really encountered where you just got like an annual car wash package or you got a, a monthly car wash membership or something like that. I was like, what is that all about? I mean, gosh, people in Tulare like their white trucks clean. <laughs> and I first thought... Maybe it's because they drive white trucks and they want white, you know, to be clean. I don't know. I wasn't here very long and I figured it out. (laughs) A lot of dust around here. Like, you just leave your car parked, you don't do anything, you come back and be like half inch of dust covering, like, my goodness. You say, why are we talking about car washes? Because the same is true in our lives. And you don't have to just be in Tulare. You can be anywhere. If you don't do anything, just living in this culture, you're going to accumulate a lot of dirt and dust in your mind, in your life. And every time you see a car wash or you buy that membership and you get your car washed, just think, that's a lot of what church is about. When we gather in church, when we go to community group, we're trying, saying, make ourselves available to God. Kind of wash us up a little bit. Help get some of the dust off God. Help get some of the dirt cleared out. Because if I don't take any steps, I'm going to all of a sudden find myself really, really dirty and just not caring anymore. I've just kind of accepted it. And I'll start looking around and see if somebody else's car is dirtier than mine. And I'll say, I'm not doing too bad. Look at their dirty car. Already mentioned with entitlement, give thanks to God. Remember God's grace. With pride, focus on your relationship with God. Learn humility. Establish safeguards in your life. As Scripture says, finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. I would encourage you to read Ephesians 6 and learn more about that. Waking up to the blessing of God's strength involves praising God, preparing God, and participating in the plan and purpose of God. You get involved in what God's doing. And somehow Samson missed out on that. I mean, not completely. 
but certainly to a large degree. And can I tell you one of the saddest verses in Scripture? After playing games with the power of God, the strength of God over and over, we're told in Samson's story that as Delilah just nagged him and nagged him. How many of you know nagging is good for nothing? Yeah. She just nagged him and nagged him. And he finally, after playing games with her and telling him this thing, he finally said, okay, it's my hair. You shave my head, I'll have no strength. I mean, at this point, if you're reading the story, you've got to be screaming like, Samson, what are you doing? Best I can tell from reading the story, he'd already consumed alcohol. He'd already touched many dead carcasses. One point, he goes out and slaughters 30 people and takes their clothes because he lost a bet on a riddle. He was touching all kinds of dead bodies. He was breaking his vows. He didn't take it seriously at all. And on that fateful day, he said, if you shave my head, I'll have no strength. According to the story, she shaved his head while he was sleeping, and then said, wake up, Samson, the Philistines are here. And here's the saddest verse. When the Philistines entered the room, Scripture says Samson went to take them on only to discover what? That the Lord had left him. And he had no strength. It was like there's three things here, Samson, strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. Now, again, I don't think he's out from a salvation standpoint. I don't think it's about him not being in heaven. What I'm saying is God said, I'm tired of you playing your game, Samson, and I left you. And when I left you, I left you to your own consequences. I left you to your own choices. I left you in your own strength to take care of the own problem that you created. And you want to know why that's so sad? Because it's not just a story that we read about from a long time ago. It's a story we see lived out today. And as a pastor, it breaks my heart. And you never know. You just never know when God knows our hearts. You never know when God's going to say, look, okay, you're not even trying anymore. And the only way that I can hashtag bless you is to leave you. And you go through a tremendous amount of pain. His eyes are gouged out. He's blinded. He begins to be made a mockery of And the reason I think I'll see Samson in heaven someday is because Scripture said his hair began to grow back a little bit. And blinded and being mocked, he prayed a final prayer, God, give me the strength to at least take out these Philistines who are making a mockery of you. And God, forgive me for all the ways in which I helped create this situation where you're being mocked and ridiculed. God, show yourself for who you are. And that's when he pushed down the pillars that held the building up. God once again returned and gave him incredible strength. I'll be the first to tell you, it's, it's a tough story. There's a lot of questions that can come out of that story. It's a sad story. but may be a story that we can learn from. May we not be, may it not be a part of our story that sometimes we just keep making a, a joke out of our relationship with God. We don't take it seriously that he's here for us, that he's given us his word to give us strength and power to renew our minds and guide us, that we just keep making almost a joke out of our relationship with God, not taking it seriously, keep walking into the enemy territory, thinking I can handle, I can handle, I can handle. I want it, I want it, I want it. I deserve it. Only to wake up someday where God says, 
I'm going to bless you. But in order for that to happen, I've got to step away from you and you're going to have to experience some consequences because that's what it's going to take to wake you up. 